Okay. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Courtney. That saves me some talking at the beginning here. Um, what I do want to say is I, I'm um, I'm new in my current role at Trails. I've been in this job for four months. Um, and I was the deputy chief of school climate and culture for almost five years. Um, so in today, today, while I'm really going to focus on the work at Trails, I'm also going to pull in some of the work that we did at the school district of Philadelphia, because it is sort of um, informing and exemplifying some of the, the things that I'm trying to create and envision at Trails. Um, I really hope that as we go, that you'll feel free to jump in and tell me, you know, ask questions or tell me that some of these ideas are not good ideas because I'm like, you're gonna see early stage work that's been very much and still in the visioning stage in, in a lot of cases. And so um, your expertise is so welcome. Also, um, you know, I, I, I do have a research background, but I come at this work with the heart of a practitioner. Um, I've been a teacher, a school leader, and a district level leader here in Philadelphia. And so I draw on research to inform the work, but um, conducting implementation science research is not my primary focus. And you'll see that in what I share. So I am very receptive, a real sponge for your feedback. Um, all right. So I have a few goals for today. Um, I want, I'm gonna share a little bit about trails, which is the context for this work. I'm gonna talk about sort of our current practice research challenge. Um, and I'm gonna talk about our approach to meeting that challenge. And in that, as I mentioned, you're gonna see a lot of sort of new ideas and, and things we're really still formulating. And then I'm gonna talk about some of our next, next steps and challenges and, and questions. Um, and as I mentioned, your, your your thoughts on all of those are are so much more than welcome. Um, so I want to start with a couple of acknowledgments. Um, so uh, Elizabeth Koshman, who's the founder of Trails, and um, you know brought me in to really focus on implementation, um, which is kind of a cool step, I think, for the organization given where they are right now. Um, it's a she really is committed to implementation science um, as a, a mechanism for helping us um, expand uh, trails impact. Um, I also want to acknowledge Natalie Rodriguez Quintana, who's my my colleague. She's the uh, trails chief clinical and research officer, and we work really hand in hand. Um, Emily, Emily Billick at the University of Michigan, who has um, been really instrumental in a lot of the research on trails to date. And my colleague, Shannon Ellis, at the School District of Philadelphia, who I think was going to join today but wasn't able to. But if she were, I would have asked her to chime in when I talk about the um, school district work because we really built that together. Um, all right. Without further ado, I will tell you a little bit more about TRAILS. So TRAILS stands for Translating Research to Action to Improve the Lives of Students. And you can see why we need an acronym. Um, so TRAILS it is. So Trails, as Courtney, Courtney mentioned, is a national organization. It's based in Ann Ar Arbor Mission and started as a project of the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, it provides training and resources to build the capacity of schools to provide evidence-based mental health support to students. Um, we currently focus on K-12 schools. Most of our work is fo with folks we identify as school mental health professionals, so usually counselors or social workers. Um, though in the case of our social emotional learning programming that I'll talk about in a second, that also includes classroom teachers. Um, we don't, as far as our approach, we don't market our services to schools or districts. We're not like a program that you buy off the shelf, like Second Step or CBITS or, um, we, our, our goal is to partner with states as a public health solution. So we, um, our, our goal is to work with states to provide districts and schools with feasible, equitable, high quality program as a state level response to the public health crisis of youth mental health. We don't want schools to have to pay for our, our stuff. Um, so that is sort of how we are, are leveraging um, and, and, and um, building as an organization. Just quickly about our growth um, in 2013, as I mentioned, it started as a program of the University of Michigan and served two schools in Ann Arbor. Um, this last year, we had a $21 million operating budget serving approximately 950 schools in Michigan, as well as hundreds of schools in other states. 
Um, and the work in Michigan was entirely supported by uh, le legislative and med Medicaid funds from the state as well. There is some philanthropic money in there as well. Um, we have now secured partnership and funding with an additional states, and we have several states in the pipeline. Uh, we're also a Blue Meridian Partners investee. I don't know if you know anything about that, but they do a lot of um, um, really targeted investment and support of growing um, uh, organizations. Um, a little bit about our programs. So uh, if you're familiar with work in schools, which I know some of you are, um, you're familiar with this tier language. So this is um, when we say tier one, we're talking about programs that serve all students in the school. When we talk about tier two, we're talking about programs that serve some students who've been identified as not responding to the programming at tier one. And when we talk about tier three, those are programs that target just a few students. They're usually individualized for students or who are having the greatest challenges. Um, so TRAILS um, at Tier 1 provides a classroom social-emotional learning curriculum. Um, we're expanding that now to include all grade levels, K to 12, multiple languages, and an embedded sort of integrated whole day focus with like a lot of flexible elements. So it's not just a curriculum. Um, we support schools with universal screening. We um, provide suicide prevention training and resources. That's I describe that as Tier 1 because that's sort of education and prevention. Um, for all school staff, for caregivers, for community members. And we also provide assistance for districts as they're working to develop mental health policies. Um, at tier two, and this is kind of the bread and butter of trails where trails began and sort of the, 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 the foothold, the, the main, uh, I guess, anchor of our work. Um, we have um, cognitive behavioral therapy based interventions for students who are exhibiting signs of depression or anxiety. Um, these are like 12 week interventions that kids are identified for, um, in some cases, based on a universal screener, if the school has that capacity, um, or based on, you know, other indicators that they're in, that they're in distress. Um, and we provide a lot of cap capacity building training and coaching for school mental health professionals to prepare them to deliver this programming. And whether they're using our sort of workshops and our, our excuse me, worksheets and materials or not, it builds their capacity in, in providing um, CBT-based supports for all students. We also provide uh, mindfulness programming at Tier 2. And for Tier 3, um, our focus is really around capacity building for crisis response and specifically for students who are exhibiting um, suicidality. So uh, we provide training and access to a suicide risk screener. We provide protocols and guidelines for ensuring continuation of care, both for treatment as well as when kids are returning back into the school. Um, any questions or anything about that, feel free to just, you know, pop off mute and jump in. Um, You're great. I do yeah. have a question. Uh -huh. Are you mostly based in Michigan? So, you say? yeah, we're currently most, I think most of our work and our funding is still in Michigan. However, we ha um, just have brought another state on as a partner that we're expanding into beginning in the fall. We also have a pretty big presence in a number of other states and we have some sites in Canada. Um, but some of those were established as sort of more like one-off districts before we moved to this like state partnership model. So moving forward, we're really, really focusing on bringing on kind of one state at a time and doing that in a right. really coordinated, comprehensive way. So I will um, follow up with you, uh, but I actually reside in the Upper Peninsula of oh. Michigan and they forget about us all yeah. the time. And I, this kind of stuff is just so needed. So um, I'll pick we're your brain. But I won't yeah, use. we're definitely in some in schools up there. So and some of our staff, we're a virtual organization. So people live everywhere and some of our staff live up there. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Reach out to me for sure. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is is in in Michigan administered at the ISD level. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the ISDs, it's um integrated school district or something it, intermediate school district. They're like these big conglomerations of districts. So it's like the Uber district, which propose, poses a lot of implementation problems, um, as you might imagine, but um, it is sort of how it's clustered and organized. So um, Trails has about 90 staff um, growing really fast. When I came on four months ago, there were like 70 staff. So like this thing is moving. 
Um, most of the staff sit in one of two departments. So on this slide, you'll see on the left, our clinical and research um, department that's um, overseen by my colleague, Natalie. And that's where program development happens. That's where um, our external and internal research is happening, as well as all of our training. So our, our training and capacity building for schools lives in that, in that department. Um, the, the department that I oversee is called innovation and implementation. And within that department, and a lot of this is new, like I've just kind of restructured it to look like this. <laughs> um, so we have state implementation teams. So for example, in Michigan, we have um, 13 folks who do nothing but support implementation in Michigan. So they have caseloads of districts and they interface with those districts to try and support implementation. The vast, vast majority of that support is currently aimed at the school mental health providers. Um, and I'll talk more about how we're sort of thinking about that. Um, we also have a brand new implementation innovation team. So these folks do not have a caseload. Um, and their purpose, their, this team is to um, take data and information that we collect about implementation and about our implementors and work with our other teams, clinical and, and uh, implementation, to develop, adapt implementation strategies. So, and to um, run formal pilots of those implementation strategies as we develop them. That's a whole new thing. I also see the, uh, the technology innovation team, which does like our website. Um, that's a whole adventure for me. Um, a real, I'm, I'm really learning, um, but we're trying to think broadly about how we use technology as an implementation strategy, because in my mind, that is what it is. Um, and then coming soon, we're going to be building an anchor district program. And so the idea is that one of our value adds for our state partners will be that we bring particular expertise and focus to um, their highest need districts. So this would include large urban districts. This may include districts serving um, serving Indian reservations, um, rural populations. So that is one of the pieces that we are bringing to, uh, we are building to be able to bring to our partners. Um, there's a lot of research on trails and, and soon will be more. Um, we're, we have a multi-year RCT that's funded by IES that's underway now in, with Detroit Public Schools. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but you can, I'll, you'll have these slides. You can always go back and revisit this. Um, so our research has focused both on student outcomes and implementation outcomes. Um, and we have a solid and, solid and growing body of research that supports the effectiveness of the programs in improving student depression and anxiety and in building capacity and knowledge at the school level to deliver high quality programming. Um, additionally, you know, some folks like Emily Billick and Natalie have been involved in um, taking a look through an implementation science lens. So we've been, we do have some data from our school mental health providers um, that indicates that they find our programs feasible, acceptable, appropriate. Um, does that mean they're always being fully implemented? Absolutely not. So that brings me to our next, um, our challenge. So our challenge um, that we're facing currently as an organization is essentially to build an implement, implementation model for trails that checks all these boxes. It has to be nationally scalable. It has to cultivate, cultivate receptive and supportive outer contexts, right? We think about those state partners as the outer context and the districts to some extent as the outer part um, context for implementation. It also has to attend to the realities of complex inner contexts. Um, it needs to address the needs of a very complex web of implementer role groups. I'm really big on thinking about implementer role groups, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, it needs to reflect the pertinent frameworks and insights from research. It needs to use strategies that are flexible enough to be adapted to different contexts, but stable enough that we can reliably measure them and look at how effective they are. Um, it needs to have the capacity to adapt, develop, pilot, and scale or phase out implementation strategies. And it needs to be able to um, connect implementation processes and strategies to outcomes and in impacts. I know for all of us here, that's like, we're all trying to do that. Um, and it needs to center the wisdom of practice. Um, that is a really big focal point for us. Um, we don't think all of the answers are in research studies. We think some of the answers are in research studies, um, but we think that our practitioners and partners can, 
can um, really, really inform our work in absolutely critical ways and have to. <clears throat> so here's kind of a general process that we're looking to adopt in building this model. It looks very nice and linear, but of course it's not. Um, and it's also still pretty aspirational at this stage. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of where we are. I would say, whoops, we have, we're making some great, gaining some great ground around step one, which is really learning about our implementers and their roles. Step two, starting to identify determinants, barriers, facilitators, and strategies. Step three, we're just starting to work in the space of innovating strategies. Um, but steps four, five, and six are ones that we are like in baby, baby stages of thinking about. Um, I'm going to, to shift a little bit now um, and talk about some of the work in Philadelphia because the general approach that I'm sort of advocating and trying to bring here mirrors work that I did there in collaboration with my colleague Shannon Ellis and lots of other folks um, there at the district. Um, there, Abby, before you do that, there is a question in the chat um, oh. looking for maybe a little more information about the implementation strategies you're using in Trails. Um, I don't know if you want to take that now or save that for later. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, yeah, okay. I'll get there. Um, so. Um, in Philadelphia, our goal, um, so we were responsible for identi identifying evidence-based practices related to school climate and culture and student well-being. In some cases, these were ones that were like PBIS that are out there that everybody knows about, check in, check out, right? Everybody knows about them. So there we were responsible for sort of identifying them, saying these are among the practices that we want schools to consider using, and then to support their implementation. So I had a whole team, which Shannon now leads, of folks who um, were experts in these particular um, EBPs. Gwen knows this well. She's been like all up in this work too. Um, and they, they were out um, in the schools all the time trying to support schools in implementing with fidelity. So our strategy there was we, we first created a roadmap for implementation for each EBP. And that roadmap included action steps, indicators, and timelines for implementation. Our second was to, was to measure implementation. So we were monitoring implementation progress in all of the schools. And then we would work to identify cohorts of stronger and weaker implementers, schools, school level, um, at the school level. So we would know where we needed to put more support or what kind of support. And then, and this work was really just getting off the ground as I was leaving, um, and I know Shannon has continued to build it, um, and it was a qualitative fit, like round. So once we had information about how schools were doing, progressing down those roadmaps, then we would go out and talk to people to try to understand what were barriers and facilitators that staff and students identified, and how could we use those in our fourth step to tailor implementation support strategies um, to better support our schools. So that was like sort of the framework that we operated in. Um, and we had some really cool tools that we developed. Um, so this is a, this is, um, we had a powerful dashboard that still exists where we could see in real time how schools were prog progressing in their action steps and indicators. So what you're looking at here is for one of our evidence-based practices, I believe this was PBIS. There were up at the top here, 109 schools in the district that had chosen to implement PBIS. At this moment in time that we screen captured here, 55% of them were on track, meaning they had completed the action steps that they quote unquote should have completed according to that timeline and roadmap. And here you could see, you know, this is every school in the district that was implementing um, PBIS and you could see where they were in terms of percent of areas complete. You could also see where they were stuck. So these are this is step one, which was summer planning meetings. And you could see which schools had completed it and which schools had not completed that step. And it was supported by um, a really like an interface that our coaches and school folks could use in the schools where they would just, you know, beep, beep, boop, boop, update. They, they're on step two. They completed indicator one um, so that we could can, we could see all of this information. Then we also had this follow up process where we would do, as I mentioned, a round of qualitative data collection. Um, so that we could try to understand what were those barriers, connect them to implementation outcomes, and then think about the implementation strategies that would make most, most sense to support them. So, you know, when something's not being implemented in a school, 
Someone might say, I don't feel like I'm well-trained. Okay, well, then the training hasn't been implemented with fidelity. We need to think about professional development as an implementation strategy. But more often, we hear things like, my boss doesn't prioritize it. Well, that's an adoption problem, and we need to think about alignment of messaging. What is your boss's boss telling them to prioritize? And if they're not telling them to prioritize that, how can we think about strategies that might move that a little bit? Um, so that was what it looked like in Philadelphia. And I, I really share that. I think it's kind of an interesting example, but also to so you know kind of how my brain is working around this trails work. Um, and it brings us to thinking more about how are we going about trying to build this model at, at trails? Um, so we are not yet where we were in Philadelphia. Um, where we are is we have a really well-specified programs um, that school mental health professionals like. They tell us they're acceptable, appropriate, and feasible, but they aren't implemented with consistency and, or fidelity that we want to see. And that's because of this. The school mental health professionals uh, practitioner, who's this guy in the middle here, um, us is usually a counselor or a social worker, and they sit at the center of this complex web of players and relationships. And each of these players has a role in implementation that they might not even know about. Um, so while Trails has been focusing on supporting school mental health professionals for a long time and has a fair number of implementation strategies for them, we have a lot of work to do in situating them within a system. And when we talk to school mental health um, professionals, what they tell us, the problem isn't that they don't um, want to do the work or know how to do the work. It's that they can't do the work for other reasons. Um, so this system lens really aligns with Bronfenbrenner's ecological models. It aligns with school uh, focus frameworks like um, Anthony Breich's or Organizing Schools for Improvement. It aligns with, you know, frequently cited implementation science frameworks, CIFR, EPIS, we see outer context, we see inner context, we see all that stuff in here, right? Um, and um, you can see that, that we have implementers on here. We call them all implementers because they all have a role in implementation. Um, they occupy both outer and in, inner context, for example. Um, so our implementation model has to be very systems focus, focused, and it has to pay close attention to the strategies we need to use to engage every implementer role group. And we're just starting that work at Trails. Any questions or anything? I can't see the chat, so feel free to jump in. Um, lots of positive feedback. Um, one oh. question <laughs> about whether there were challenges with partners in putting information into the PBIS dashboard, and if so, how you overcame that. Oh, yes. It's terrible. Um, getting people, and it, it's mostly our coaches that do that data entry. Um, they did not want to do it, but we got them. So now PBIS was actually a much easier lift because if you know PBIS, they do a lot of data collection as part of the model. Um, and we've had great directors on our PBIS team who really focus on that. So that team was particularly um, ready to do that work and wasn't a hard lift. Now, our restorative justice team that goes into schools and teaches them how to run restorative circles, they are not about this data collection. Um, so there have been some real barriers in terms of like just buy-in and like different ways that people's different brains and philosophies work. Um, but I think at this point, and I talk to Shannon about this all the time, she's, you know, we're mostly at the point where most of the coaches do this with pretty good consistency. Um, it has not been an easy lift. So um, any other questions or anything? Okay. Nothing else in the chat. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, so where are we going with this for trails? So here's one way that I'm thinking about this challenge, and maybe you all can tell me if there's a better way. Um, I like the structure of the approach that we used in the school district, and it's grounding in basically the logic model of each EBP and the roadmap of steps. Um, and I like how linear that approach was in connecting implementation progress and outcomes back to implementation, implementer needs and strategies to address them. So 
Um, so I like this model, Lee, Smith, Lee, and Rafferty's, which is on the left here. Um, the one on the left, uh, it show, it's based on the CIFR. Um, and I find, uh, for me, a more eclectic approach is more appropriate in practice. So I've sort of changed this thing up a little bit, and I'm still, it's totally a work in progress. Um, but this, the one on the right is kind of where we're pushing. And it would be looking at implementation from the perspective of each implementer and in recognition of that ecological model. So this might be, you know, the, the school principal in Michigan, because those contextual, like a school principal in Michigan doesn't necessarily look the same as a school principal in, in Colorado. And we could obviously break it down either, even further than that, but we'll start here. Um, so here, um, the needs column over here, encompasses like a broad assortment of categories of implementer needs as they're performing their role in implementation. And these are going to vary with every implementer role group in each context, but I anticipate that the ones that I have listed here will come up a lot. Knowledge needs, logistical needs, relational needs, attitudinal needs, support needs, and alignment needs. Um, that's just based on, to some extent, the research, you know, the evidence, uh, the, the research, but also my experience in doing this work. Um, so, um, and in, in that list also really draws on the CIFR, on the EPIS with their focus on internal and external context, on the theoretical domains framework with its delineation of individual determinants as well as contextual. Um, but, in, and then, and then the, the list in the strategies column is like super incomplete. I didn't even have a chance to fill it in as much as I meant to. Um, but I added it to give you a sense of the kinds of categories of strategies that we're thinking about. Um, and I try to stay grounded in the literature on implementation strategies. Like I, I'm constantly looking at Cook et al. 2019, which is focused on um, implementation strategies specifically for schools. But um, again, there are lots of influences on the types of strategies that we consider. Um, in the target mechanism column, the third column, we acknowledge that the needs um, I have may be addressed by strategies that are actually targeting a different implementer, right? So I'm getting mixed messages, which is a barrier for me implementing, but that strategy actually has to target my boss because my boss is the one that's giving the mixed messages. So I think this target of message um, and mechanism of strategies is really important. Um, and you can see here, like on the second row that I started mocking up, a logistical need might be like, I need more time in the day to do this. So they need those logistical supports, but the target is actually the school leader. And the associated target implementation outcome would, in that case, be feasibility. It's not feasible to deliver this, um, this intervention if I don't have time in the day to do it. Um, so this, and I, you can see the metrics and indicators is like still blank because I just am still thinking about all that. Um, but to, um, so I, I am drawing on, on definitely like the Proctor Powell McMillan, McMillan 2013, which is like a super great informative piece on specifying strategies. Um, I, I, I love the work by um, Rudd, Davis and Betis in 2020. That was a piece that was in implementation science that really emphasizes um, alignment of strategies with the target implementation outcomes, which to me just makes sense. Um, and of course, Proctor's outcomes, you know, we, that is our go-to, but we are working on developing trail specific outcomes. Um, so you can see here alignment is one of our outcomes and that's not in Pro Proctor's like original list of, um, of implementation outcomes, but we think it's really critical. Um, any questions about this? This is, this is like super early stage. I'm going to get a little bit more into the, into the nitty gritty here. So Abby, can I ask one question on that? Sure thing. This is great. This is so cool to see. And I like how you're thinking about the logic model sort of specific to an implementer. Yeah. Are you also thinking about it specific to one given EBP or to trails more broadly? Or how are you sort of specifying it at that level? Well, so the implementers are attached to particular um, EBPs, mm -hmm. right? So, so we... But it depends on the role because like for the principal, their role in implementation is kind of the same for every EVP. Mm -hmm. But for the school mental health provider, it's different. So like we have a logic model that's for the school mental health provider for tier two programming and a different one for tier three programming. 
So it's sense. like a whole complicated thing. Um, and I'm not sure that we're doing it the best way. So totally open to suggestions. Um, no way, you just said it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So center the implementer. So this is our how. Um, this is obviously really messy work and beginning to think about the needs of all these implementers and the strategies we need to consider to support their role in implementation is a lot. Um, so at Trails, we're undertaking this work via a series that we launched basically when I got there and fed. So it's only been four months um, called Center the Implementer. So it's basically a series of big brainstorming sessions in which teams of staff focus on a particular implementer role group and basically consider and organize everything we know about their role and their needs and how it's going with that implementer currently. Um, so this conversation is, is a staff conversation, but it's informed by research, by data that we've collected from implementers over the years and what they've told us, and by our own observations and insights from supporting this work. Um, and then from there, we reflect on the strategies we are currently using to support implementation and also dream about what we call someday strategies. Um, so I'll show you an example of how this resulted in the development of a new strategy as an, um, as an example of kind of how this is supposed to work. Um, so this example focuses on the school principal. The principal plays a critical role in implementation. We know this from all the research, implementation science research, schools research, just all of it. Um, but Trails actually has very few strategies to support the principal's role in implementation and actually hadn't even done much work in identifying like what exactly even is that role. Um, so this work was really a blank slate. Um, so the simple center the implementer sort of process begins with a grounding in what the research tells us that this person's essential role is. And the research tells us um, so I like this particular quote, it really boils down what a lot of research says about school principals, that they are responsible for people, instruction and organization. So they're responsible for hiring, for training and coaching, for evaluating staff, for equipping staff, and for things like that you wouldn't even think about, like balancing the needs of the school with the, um, with the collective bargaining agreement that the union has negotiated. That's a big thing that principals spend a lot of time on. Um, as far as instruction, they're responsible for making sure that students are receiving what they're supposed to receive, which, though not always, is often determined by states with some input and the districts putting their own kind of twist on it. And they're responsible for making sure that the trains run on time, right? They need to make sure that rosters are created, that make sure everyone has a time in the day to do whatever they're supposed to be doing, whether it's staff member or student, uh, that there's physical place to accommodate all the activities that there are functional team structures to support all the work that needs to happen in school and that the right people have the right information to do their work well. And, and, and that might mean data in the way that we think about data. Um, and it might mean like less formal types of information. Um, so I start by providing this grounding to the center, the implementer group, because there are a lot, there are a lot of clinicians at trails and not so many people with like deep schools experience. Um, so I start with sort of grounding them on that and also with grounding them on um, what are some of the essential tasks of this person, of this role. Um, so for the, the school principal, when it comes to trails or really any intervent, like in, any intervention or initiative that's being implemented in a school, they've got to cultivate collective will and buy in. They have to get the staff on board. They have to facilitate collaboration among all staff. Because even though it's the school mental health pro professional that's delivering the intervention to the kid, every teacher, every support person, every adult in that building has a role in ensuring its success. Um, they arrange all the schedules in space. Where are these people going to meet with these small groups? How is that going to work? When in the day are, are the SEL lessons going to be delivered? And they provide support and accountability for implementation. Does this always happen, this set of tasks? Definitely not. But ideally, this is what the principal would do to ensure that TRAILS is successfully implemented. So working together with the, the Center of the Implementer group, we broke this down into a roadmap, because I like roadmaps. Um, so um, so the, we, I kind of roughed this together. The team provided a lot of feedback. We kind of co-created it. But each of the steps on this roadmap is actually a category that's consisting of many discrete activities. 
So I'll show you an example of that here. Um, step four, so you can see here, step four is cover the logistics, right? That's a lot. So here, here are some of the things that fall under covering the logistics. Um, they have to protect staff time for trails, they have to protect student time for trails, and they have to identify space for trails intervention. In order to do each one of those things, they need all these kinds of knowledge and they encounter all these kinds of barriers. Now, every principal is not going to check every one of these boxes, right? But these, this is some of the universe of stuff that principals are dealing with. Um, so in our center, the implementer group, we really talk about these. We populate these columns. We think about these barriers. We populate those. Then as the next stage of that, we think about our strategies. Right, so that's not supposed to pop up yet. Um, we think about what are we doing now to support principals in learning about trails? Well, mostly we have some one-off interview sessions and some program flyers. What are we doing to help them with staff buy-in? Uh, same kind of thing, right? Like it's general stuff. But when we come together as a team and think about what we could do, we come up with all these really cool ideas. Like, oh, what if they had this? What if we really focus on MTSS and how we embed within that and leverage the existing structures that they have in their schools? What if we collect, um, if, if we cultivate communities using chat boards and we put them in cohorts based on like what their needs are? So these are powerful brainstorming sessions are happening in these center the implementer groups. So how does this translate to an actual strategy? Well, here's one that we came up with: this idea of like, hey, principals don't even know what their responsibilities are. They will say things all the time like. Oh, that's the counselor's work. They're, I don't don't talk to me about that. And that reflects um, that they just haven't had an opportunity to really understand. No, 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 no. If you want this to work and you want to have fewer suspensions and you want to have fewer crisis um, referrals and you want to have better relationships in your schools and fewer anxious and depressed kids, you have to do these things. So we decided to try this one to build. Um, and what we built is here. We built a, um, a self-guided, um, what we call our principal pre-implementation module. We built this in Articulate. If you're familiar with that, it's a tool for like, you basically click through slides um, and you can put voiceovers in there. We have a video in there from one of the clinicians talking about the program, but it's self-guided. It takes about 20 minutes for them to complete. It's pretty engaging. And the goal is that um, it's to be completed in the spring before they start implementing in the fall. So to help them, and this one is focused on pre-implementation, which is the first four steps on the roadmap. Um, so we're trying to help them get ready by focusing on those four, first four steps. So there's like high level information in there, like what are trails programs? There's tools and steps for them to think about some planning. And then there's opportunities for them to share information with us, just like embedded in the module. So it doesn't feel like they're taking a survey. Um, so we are piloting this right now in Colorado, which is the state where we're rolling out our, our programming for the first time in the fall. So we're asking all of the Colorado principals to complete this module. And they keep, they keep saying, oh, I'll forward it to my counselor. No, 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 no. You got to do this. Oh, are you sure that? I don't know. Please do it. It will help. Okay. So we are getting them to do it. Um, but it, it's definitely a stretch for some of them to think about this as their role. Here's a little more on that. So like we have planning suggestions and tools and we try to get super concrete. So in this section on building staff buy-in, we're providing like really concrete suggestion. Have a meeting with your staff now to introduce trails. Here's the agenda. Like use this agenda. We can provide you with content for the agenda. Um, and like ask, you know, in terms of covering logistics, focusing on like, ask yourself some of these questions because they may not have thought of these things. We find in oftentimes that they haven't. Who's going to deliver these programs? What are their other responsibilities? How are you going to streamline those other responsibilities? How are you going to um, structure student schedules so that the same kid isn't, isn't supposed to have math intervention and, um, and CBT group at the same time? Um, so we're trying to really walk them through. And then we also have in this module, like little ways of collecting data. Um, so we ask them things like this, which of the following types of support would be helpful? Well, I want to know how to use trails along with second step. I, I want to know more about MTSS because I know I'm supposed to be doing that, but I don't really get it. 
I want to know more about um, how um, how I as a leader can support MTSS. I'm already doing it in my building. There's also this one that's covered up is like information about universal screening because they almost always um, want to do universal screening. And so we have to help them figure that out. Then we also ask them just sort of like, how's it going? Like, how are you feeling about each of the following? Finding time for staff to be trained. And they can say, this is pretty doable. This could be difficult. Or this is a major challenge. Based on the data that they're providing, we're going to put them in cohorts. And we're going to target particular types of implementation strategies. There's Shannon. Say hi. Um, that's, my, that's my partner in crime for all of the school district um, implementation science work. And she is now leading that work. Um, so we're asking them questions that are designed to help us better target our supports to them. And that's not something Trails has really ever done. Um, so that's all new. So enough about that thing. Oh, except this. So center the envelope. I just talked about the principle. We have roadmaps. This is only like half of them. We have roadmaps that we're developing and doing center the implementer work for all these different roles and responsibilities. And then we're going to think about prioritizing. Who do we need to focus on first? And of those someday strategies, which ones do we need to develop? Where is there a strategy out there existing in the literature that we can just sort of embrace? Um, and how do we want to go about doing that work? So that brings us to um, next steps and challenges, which I put all on the same slide. Um, basically, how do we capture implementation in real time? So we could do that in the school district because we had coaches who were in those schools every day who could talk to school leaders and staff and figure out what was going on. We don't have that with trails. We have we have virtual coaching sessions that they participate in. A lot of the training is virtual. Um, so how do we capture implementation in a way that can inform our supports? Um, we want to think, another challenge is thinking about how do we fully leverage technology? Right now we have a website, it's fine, but like we need to be doing a lot more to leverage technology as an intervention strategy, essentially. Um, yes, there's a parent care caregiver roadmap. Um, the, uh, we are also thinking about our, implementation outcomes. So we're starting with proctors as a great starting point, but we're also thinking about what other ones, equity, alignment, some of these things that I know in some of the later literature that's reflecting on proctor have come up. Um, then formally piloting more strategies. So we're starting with a pretty formal pilot of that um, module. What else are we going to develop? That's going to be some of our work of the summer is picking a couple more things to like target. And then of course, the, the big question, how do we connect our strategies to outcomes and how do we connect those outcomes to student impacts? That's a question for another day. Um, so that's my, that's my stuff. Um, I have some references here that I'm happy to share the slides so you can, you can um, review those at your leisure. Um, but yeah, any, what questions or um, ideas or feedback do you have? Someone asks, is there someone telling the principal to do this other than you? State partnerships? Yeah. So um, the state, that is that is a whole other great question and a whole other web of state part of, um, sorry, of implementation strategies that we're thinking about. So in Michigan, the ISD, which is that macro school district, tells the, the schools opt into trails. Not every school in Michigan is using it. So they decide to use it. Um, so I guess in that way, we have an audience that is inclined to want to buy in. And we're having the same experience in Colorado. We don't have any schools that are forced to do trails. So in that way, we haven't, we have found that principals are interested in like, how can I better support this? Um, I think we will probably run up against some of that as we continue to grow and we're going to have to figure that out because um, I definitely have a lot of experience with telling, trying to tell principals to do things they don't want to do and it, it's, it's a losing battle. So I think we have to think about 
How do we cultivate that buy-in so that they are engaged in wanting to do that? And a lot of that comes down to the, you know, the downstream impacts, fewer suspensions, fewer crisis referrals, less teacher turnover. Your teachers will be happier if your students are happier. Um, so kind of emphasizing all of that kind of stuff. I live in a state without Medicaid expansion. Would this be a major barrier to implement trails? Um, I don't know. That's just how it's structured in Michigan. I don't think that's necessary. Like that is how the state of Michigan decided to structure the funding. I don't think that that's necessarily going to be the model in every state. Shannon's here too. So you can ask both of us questions about the school district. <laughs> Um, and there was a, a question from Jill asking if you could share a little more about the qualitative work that you're beginning. It, the, the work in, in the school district or the work? It just says, could you talk more about the qualitative work you're beginning? Jill, I don't know if you want to unmute and say a little more about what you were thinking. Sure. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding the qualitative work, but are you reaching out to some of it sounded like you were reaching out to some implementer groups to see how it's going to get the oh, perspectives yeah. on how they're yeah. experiencing trails? Yeah. Yep. So well, we've been doing some of that for a long time. So trails have um collects a fair amount of data, mostly from school mental health professionals, some also from the classroom teachers who are implementing the SEL programs. And then we have like just a bunch of anecdotal kind of stuff from various other implementer groups. But we are over the summer going to be building a plan to um, to uh, formalize that. So we're going to be doing focus groups with all these different implementer groups. We're really working to build up our student engagement um, with this work as well. We haven't gotten a lot of student feedback, but we have a, a roadmap for students and we need them to help us flesh that out. Same with parents and caregivers. We have a surprising amount of contact with parents and caregivers, actually. They often have questions about trails and they'll get sent to us, the clinical team that is. Um, we do a lot of informational sessions, especially like the suicide prevention work. There's very often, um, there's very often parents that attend those. Um, so we do get feedback there. Someone asked, any reluctance making this formal implementation science research for scholarly publication? Um, well, I haven't tried to do that. <laughs> um, I don't have time. Um, the I, I don't know. I, I don't think so, because I think all of it would be very aggregate. You know, I, I don't think we would be doing the work from the perspective of particular schools. Um, but yeah, time is the barrier there. I mean, I imagine this varies based on the district and maybe also based on the component of trails, but I'm curious the extent to which you think of trails as being sort of additional programming that districts aren't already doing or replacing content into what they're already doing. Like if they already have tier two groups and trails is providing the content for it, versus like to do trails, you really have to be getting tier two groups off the ground because I imagine that impacts oh, a yeah. lot on how you think about this work. Uh, no, it could totally be either. It's designed okay. to be really flexible, which, you know, brings some, some fidelity issues, but like it's designed to be, um, hey, if they already have second step in place, maybe they don't need the tier one SEL curriculum, or maybe they do it in addition. If they already are doing C bits, they should look and see what of what we're offering is useful. Maybe it's just the suicide prevention components, um, but it may be that they have a tier two group space where they don't have like an EBP. Right. And this could go in there. Got it. So it sounds like that very much varies district to district and that's part of the challenge yeah. I imagine I'm thinking about strategies. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Yeah, and it. I think it has to vary district to district because there's mm -hmm. never gonna be a time when all schools are, you know, presenting the same set of programs and circumstances. And, but it's really, I like being in this position where we're talking about partnering with states and we're not like out there competing with other programs. Cause I don't think that's very productive. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And the fact that it's flexible where if it fits this need of like, we have the structure for groups, but we don't have anything of a space to do there and it can provide that. Yeah. Or it can be providing the structure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, what they're implementing does not seem similar to trails, even though they think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that, you know, until you've had this specialized training and really understanding the CBT lens, I don't think people can really understand how it's different. Um, yeah. Abby, I'm curious how states or prospective partners typically find you, or if you have a, if you all have a dissemination strategy and, and how, how that works for you to identify new partners. Um, they've all been coming to us. So I think it's like, I think maybe there, maybe you can tell me, I think maybe there aren't that many providers out there that are doing this work in this way. Um, there are a lot of programs that schools can purchase and implement, but I don't think there are tons of options. So we actually get a lot of contacts, like more than we can handle, um, uh, from organization, from, you know, schools, districts that are interested in the work. That makes sense. I think it speaks to the need right now for more mental health supports and services in schools, um, yeah. are, are finding yeah. you. I think that there's another piece of this that's interesting because um, some partners are interested in framing it more as workforce development. And I don't know to what extent that's like a response to political things or like how much people want to talk about mental health or how much people don't like the word social emotional learning. Um, but but I think that it, we also agree that it is workforce development and we think that it is a retention strategy and we think that it is all those things. We haven't conducted research on that really specifically, um, but I think it's interesting that that is the lens that some prospective partners want to bring. Um, all right, well, I can get the slides. Should I send them today? Yes, that would okay. be perfect. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. This was great. And feel free to, you know, shoot me a message. If you have other ideas, I'll put my email in the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a really interesting and informative talk, and it was really great to hear more about your work. Thank, thank you, you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you for having me. Oops, wait, I put that in the wrong thing. There we go. Thank you all. Perfect. Thank you so much, Abby. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.